11 page stories written through LT Zupan read by LT Zupan story number 12 a broad sigh one dash 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 Smith was not totally in control of his deepest, most innate drives. Smith was remarkably in control and aware of his self in general. All the same, straggling parallax particle gobs of his core wiring were seemingly unstoppable, such as the futile urges and efforts to overcome a few of his countless problems, not to mention the resultant profoundly painful tiredness which always followed. A tiredness worse than a tiredness, a hurting worse than hurting. This exquisitely sharp, bland torment lived in a pit further and deeper, down and in, than the so-called core of one's soul. He was just so very fucking tired. Beyond that, of course, he was still staying true to his principle and the efforts that bred of holding out for love. That he would never let die. The bulk of his most recent afore spoke of futile efforts started three months after he had spent one or two minutes witnessing an elderly ladybug's final odyssey. The forlorn tiny creature was finished wading through the candle flame sea of Terran time. The little bug was ready to unbraid our complex mortal stone coil, the connected composite the attaches, the like. His thought, driven by an unbridled, uncurbed, yet unexciting drive, followed by his actions, was to leave his home in Massachusetts. His epiphany came from an awareness that he lived in a prodigious, jumbo-sized country, what with well over 150 million women. So if all his years of seeking true love had failed, with every one of them that he had met in so many different places and regions, then maybe it was time he went global. This was one of his many last-ditch efforts in life. And what was really the most shocking thing of all, as if anything of that nature on that level at that time could really shock at this point, it actually worked. He actually found what he had been looking for, for so very, very, very long. He found his true love. It took Smith Stanley Roberts quite some time before even he himself could believe it. And so now, somehow, he was managing, and rather well in fact, living on the other side of this planet. He had found the large and populous, well-kept secret that is the coastal city of Da Nang, nestled appropriately in one of central Vietnam's many paradisiacal oceanic provinces. The time was early 2019. He had now been in town six months and it was safe to say he had settled in. He was technically and geographically speaking in a much better place for whatever that could have been and wasn't worth. Now any normal person such as this overly beloved fond and feigned upon author would be quick to notice and admit that there definitely is often such a thing as a geographical cure. Obvious examples of this phenomenon would be Holocaust survivors and refugees. For many of these victims, simply changing their geography did very much cure the absolute horror of their tragic former situations. If your hand is hovering over a flame, burning, and you can change your geography, move your hand over to some tepid water, etc. Well, it's quite a fantastical and obviously legitimate geographical cure. On the other hand, in all fairness, perhaps some understandable confusion does arrive for everyone from the fact that not every cure works. Many, many times in life, unfortunately, cures do not work. But not always. Regardless, Smith, the one being focused on now, afflicted with the deepest of soul sicknesses, is far from what we could call a normal individual, in spite of his very normal early life. For Smith, every acquisition of medicine was just a garnered ruse, 
stemming from augments of involuntary compulsion that his cleverly masked virus of pain forced through. And of course, always, he was doomed to realize this was the case later, when it was much too late. And it was far too late for him now. He could never undo his innocent grasping. Yet the end was never near enough. Two, dash, dash, dash. She was truly perfect, the best woman on earth. Whatever strange, mild alterations Smith's oddness had put her through, she was always quick to kindly accommodate him. It still took him aback, as they say, in factoid. He woke up at 6 p.m. today. He had been awake until 7 a.m. the night before. She understood he had problems sleeping, and this was totally fine. Smith was always good to Fuong, and that was all that really mattered to her. She could be flexible with the many small, peculiar trivialities Smith represented. She loved him, and he loved her, and they were always, always good to each other. Smith had multitudes of minor systems in his supposedly nuanced life, as old and far along as he now was. After 4 p.m. hit, some part of him, half asleep, knew it. It was always the same choice. He could endure physical tiredness nearly every single day and endeavor to correct his schedule, mainly for the sake of blessed sunshine, or he could go to the complete opposite of all that, which is generally what he always gave in to, unless he had something crucial to attend to, such as a flight. This giving in gave him an intense and acute sensation of guilt almost every time, after which he would crawl into the sequences of preparing breakfast, the first phase of his usual morning scenarios. Breakfast this morning had a base of some Walmart-ish supermarket-bought noodles that were near in consistency to extra-thick egg noodles. Smith added diced tomatoes, along with some of their juice, from a pop-top tin can, garlic and lemon pepper powders, and finished with an extremely hot cup or two of water, heated in his hometel's metal kettle. It was enough to quell the phosphate-hungering stomach area of his goddamn torso. He simultaneously prepared and casually, slowly went through the several other threads woven into his startup routine's faceted fabric much like an old, worn-down robot would. He could see the pleasure, satisfaction, ease, and the excitement of what came after, on the fucking horizon, as it neared. This meant absolutely nothing to him. He created a mild, unspecified nutritional concoction to drink for his belly pain in his gut, as the finale of his day beginning. It kicked in as he walked outside to get coffee for himself, milk tea for his love. For many years now, there had been a phenomena of novelty Smith often experienced because of his ignorance to the nature of the human world and the many qualities or arrangings of it. Phenomena oft triggered by merely walking around foreignness. But that had long since dissipated, and well before he had had a chance to realize it. It was a precious thing that Smith had really cherished, now gone forever, more or less. He lit a pre-rolled white horse cigarette and rubbed the lenses of his sunglasses in moderately paced circles with the cloth from the corner of his frayed, sunburnt t-shirt. He was out yet again, walking around his familiar neighborhood. Three, dash, dash, dash. He didn't have time to think about how he always felt so old that he felt dead inside, or that he would someday have to pay for the arrogance of haplessly thinking, before he could even stop his own mind, that is that he knew all the tricks to beat everything in the human systemology. He only had a minute or three, actually, before the force of the people outside kicked in. It was still up for delegation as to whether or not this was a good thing. This diversionary swell of a pressure field, singularly caused by automators that called themselves human. Regardless, this didn't exactly bother him too much. The sidewalks were uneven and dreamy. Lone, strangely designed bricks practically jumped out of place on occasion. If you didn't keep some close subconscious eyes on them, they would trip you up and stub your tennis shoe toe. Smith had a precision-mounted route and avoided the people formerly shocked by his western-ass existence, 
long hair and all. Still, this did not weed out the at least two to four people every day who stopped and stared at him as he walked. Usually it started when they briefly locked eyes around 50 feet away. Some of them eventually got over it, some did not. To Smith, this was just a minor disturbance, a boring irrelevance. He walked first into a coffee shop and then into a tea shop. He was worlds away from joyous tremulosity, uncomforted and blanklessly blank. The alley behind his hotel, still in front of Fuong's shop, looked rusted. If it is possible for an entire alley to grow the metallic chiseling fungus known as rust, that is. Four dash dash dash. After Smith broached through the multifarious conglomeration, oodling outside of the shop, he was shifted into another world in the space of a few minutes. Because of her, he always was, but the surprise of it never relented. His potpourri melange of soulless vacuity, his mishmash medley of variant eloquent paintings, all vanished in a second, never leaving a grain of a trace. After that, his gratefulness was quickly substituted with whatever they came to talk about on that particular day. The pain had led him to something worse than a numbness long, long ago. She injected her care into the numb. He was pretty sure she had no idea about any of this, which is probably why it worked. And he began to experience a new life, picking up where the precious few of Smith's rare, beautiful memories had left off so long ago. It was so strange to him, living a good life that really was just good. This was almost a daily event for him now, and it didn't seem to be showing any signs of letting up. Every time he walked, lucked into the experience, he sucked all of the marrow from it that he possibly could, habituated and conditioned to a fear of this goodness ending so soon. Five, dash, dash, dash. Although it was more than enough of what he needed, and perhaps he was finally beginning to heal, it was not strictly an everyday thing. On random days, some random fuckhead would come out of the blue, taking the form of a customer at Philong's shop, and ruin a substantive fraction of his, and often her, day. He could deal with it all, though. These events were like small vegetables compared to what he had been through, and what she had been through. The women, Philong's customers and acquaintances, who almost glared at Smith because of all the idiotic Western men that had come to Vietnam before him, and given his kind a bit of a bad name, they were pretty easy to cope with, and Smith was too tired to be tried by most anything. Also, Fuong had ways of explaining everything to everyone. Ultimately, she was happy. He kissed her on her small, beautiful, dappled cheek and went to the ocean. The ocean was quiet, muted, it was only a 15-minute walk from his home. Fa'ang never wanted to go to this branch of shores with Smith. She believed the smell, that was relatively unfrequently bereft enough to waft over to visit them, came from people pissing and shitting, hidden around the wayside. It made her laugh, as a matter of fact. The time he spent here that very dusk triggered a rare nostalgia, albeit short-range nostalgia, a memory lane extending back maybe three or four months. Six dash dash dash. Smith Stanley Roberts the second, being a fic fictional character, existed in much the same way, perhaps, that many dreams exist, and cozily clothed in that sterile, pleated robe of a contextual aftermath. One of his multiple beneficial attributes that he expressed for others was introspection. As an example of this, Smith knew primarily that when an overwhelming bundle of thought came in all at once, it could never be written down or extrapolated. Secondarily, he was indifferent to the judgment surrounding meaningless expression. To him and him alone, not just some author out there in the ether. Those two facings were stamped on the same coinage, flipping about, reckless and construy. Additionally, Tertiarily, Smith came from an era, or a micro-epoch, where steel toe boots were common. Not for any real reason, other than the fact that they fucking rocked. And that, most importantly, wasn't a big deal at all. 
especially to the oh-so-many people who sported them on their two feet back then. So despite a semi-rare flashback like this one, reboots and prequels were usually dismissed as creative cop-outs. Because that's almost always what they truly fucking are. That spent by this generation rarely entertained the idea of, nor were nearly ever even privy to. They actually cared enough and bit the bullet enough and disregarded the bullshit piggy bank incentivizing enough to be creative. Not that any of that cares to matter anymore. Is that paying homage or just fucking copying? So, his memories drew him back three or four months, and it was just after he had arrived in Da Nang, 50 days before Smith had the great fortune of consummating perfect fa'ong. Three weeks into living abroad, things were now routine and calm. He went out to his standard bar crawl. Before he quit all of that, after finding his love, first off was Minsk, and the scenery of it begged the patronage to feel like he, or she, or it, had stumbled upon quite an evolved scene. Everyone talked with each other, still everyone was 35% nervous to talk with anyone they didn't know. It was weighted with organic foliage decor, and usually within an hour, anyone with a developed and unencumbered by being fake soul had a distinctive flavor in their mouth begging them to leave, which Smith was always quick to oblige. The place next door, the filling station, was generally his next obvious go-to. At the filling station, throughout the course of a few months, Smith had witnessed at least three different distinctive eras. One of these highlighted a binary happenstance comprised of overly accommodating women and asshole late middle-aged men, the latter of which were not worth thinking or saying much about. The women being Viet, Namis, largely appeared to be tiny girls, although they were all at least 20 years old. Smith would occasionally find the vibe of this the place homey and sit at the bar for a few hours drinking deeply and steadily. The women were not alluring to him, which Smith's seasoned nature that caused this they appreciated. But they were great company. He drank and tried not to request too many songs on the free YouTube jukebox-esque system, all too prevalent in the Da Nang expat bar scene. During the frequent hot sunny days, a crazy woman crouched across the street from the filling station ready for anything. Smith would walk along and avoid the connections of passers-by, crossing the street when he came near her. She had taken off all of her clothes a year prior and urinated loudly, apparently. He moved on to the Heaven Bar. This place had a magnetic deceit about it, unaware to the proprietor and his constituents, the regular patronage, the etc. At Heaven, Smith ordered a passion fruit Red Bull rum, except it was made with real passion fruit juice, seeds, and their bittered fruity housings intact. Shitty Vietnamese Red Bull, and a dirty rum of some kind. He knew the routine through and through. He would sit there and smoke and drink for hours. It was 11. Still two hours away from the fucked up witching hours, where a small chunk of the mixed nationalities clientele would begin to clock workedly, lose their shit, as they say. He just sat there and kept on intermittently sipping. Time dripped by. Someone approached and looked around in a quasi-nervous manner with two associates and then plopped down on one of the establishment's many couches, near Smith. These people knew Smith, but Smith didn't remember them. This happened a lot. They wanted to be in Smith's bubble, and Smith talked with them for a small while. Smith was a little drunk, and there was a comfortable latency between what occurred and what he observed. Ultimately, still, it was not the fucked up witching hour yet. Later, he would bring Fuang here and watch everyone's deflection somewhat delightedly. He sipped his drink and stared at the ceiling. Nothing of consequence. The earlier people had left and the others were awkwardizing his personal space a bit, but it was tolerable. The music was extra awful tonight, which bored Smith, and that fact was still more boring. His standardized intoxication did not infect, affect him. He had a mistaken interaction with another person that could have been better, but it was impossible to make it better, hopeless. The man had layers upon layers of rigidity, and contemporaneous atmospheric change would never melt them. 
He bumbled his broken frame back to its recharge of a caving station home, if only to forget time for a moment. Seven dash dash dash. And he was back at the ocean. The little nostalgic flash flare had passed. His worries were inconsummate, non-viable. He and everyone who was close to him already knew all of the backups behind them. The post staleness was unnoticed by most all. But if it was noticed, the fear surrounding its second or third phase, or molting, or passing, would likely be worth noting. Fear to admit that something had gone more than dry, and yet keeps typing and droning along somehow. The pressure felt that one should run along and try and cover in disguise with the help of a brain and a Google th thesaurus. He started walking back homewards. He started walking home backwards. Smith was aware of all the potential that life still had waiting for him in its delicious incubatory egg sac. And he was aware of the smallness of one human body's existence on Earth, living the length of a life form's lifespan. He just walked on at a moderate pace back home. At least he knew he would see his love again, and that did mean something to him. It meant a lot. 8. Dash, dash, dash. Smith had picked up the habit of writing. Every relationship he had been in had always carried a sizable measure of guilt with it. This was the first relationship he truly felt totally free in, to pursue his creativity. Free and supported. He typed away late into the hours. The light from the silent flat screen TV above was just enough to see the keys, and he would never have asked for more. They were both worried about the future, but more than anything else, they had hope for the future. Smith glanced regularly up at the mute television. It was tuned to the brightest channel, CNN's Money Channel. Simply, so more radiance was shed on the keyboard and on its key squares. His hotel floor was regularly polished by the cleaning staff, and Smith was wearing some of his old socks. His feet pressed against the wood floor of the generous, spacious hotel room. Va'ong was snoring, cute little small snores. He drank and wrote and smoked. More and more dreaminess came pouring in and through him. He pushed his worries about the future and about anything else as far away as they would go. He no longer, although, although he never had, cared about obviousness and those problems thereby associated. If it seemed like only one person cared to read into something, well, that carried its many associated issues as a thousand people reading into something. Nine, dash, dash, dash. And it was nearing his bedtime once again. Just one more page, he told himself. Smith seemed finally to be keeping his pace with the tumult of life. Or perhaps the fracking fracas of life itself had finally attenuated itself to a level of tolerability. Same difference, difference same. He peered back at Fa'ang on the bed, with her jumbled mess of blankets and her explosive gift of a body, and her perfect heart. He remembered many times, many hours, snuggling and cuddling with her so sweetly. Afterwards, there was the extended phase of expecting the mellowing of their drama to have some kind of shitty consequence from her, which, of course, never came. He thought about how he would snuggle her again so very soon, and how she would instantly accept him when he got near, once she could feel his warmth. Everything else would be forgotten by both of them. Just be good to me, she had told him. If you are always good to me, I will always be good to you. So simple and perfect that was for her to say to him, and so kind. So simple and perfect they were together. Ten dash dash dash. Smith knew on an almost daily basis, perhaps better than most people, that his time on earth was fleeting. He frequently woke up and felt happy for no reason, abundantly happy, like the inf infinite refulgent source of the sun's golden rays were housed inside his sternum. He alternately woke up gloomy and inexpressibly dead inside. All of his life, time and time again, Smith was met with both of these types of days, usually the latter. He knew his time was fleeting. He was highly aware of the ultimate duality, consequent impermanence, 
and conclusive wrongness of this world, this reality. Some could see it, some would not. Smith did not care about them when it came to that. Life on Earth was tolerable, and he was not afraid of not being in any rush to end it. Not just yet, but the simple fact is, there was something off. Moreover, there should be something better. Something that starts perfect and always remains the same, in the best sense of that sentiment, that is. 11 dash dash dash. So, maybe those thoughts were actually the seed instructions for future corporeal manifestation. Maybe. But Smith doubted it. He let out a broad sigh. He then went to go to sleep with his love. Hopefully forever.